Hey there. All right. So today we're going to talk about instantaneous um, attributes, which are also sometimes known as complex trace attributes. And so what we mean by instantaneous is that when we look at the seismic trace, we're calculating these attributes based on that one, um, one trace itself. And so these are one of the simplest and the oldest ones that we have. And so I always like to demonstrate what seismic attributes reveal to us in terms of the patterns by looking at some data. So we're going to start here with a nice vertical time slice through the Great South Basin, which is just offshore the South Island of, of New Zealand. And it's one of, one of my favorite data sets to, to show examples of. Okay, so here's our seismic amplitude um, data. We've got some interesting features in here from what it looks like some faults and <laughs> So we've got some faults in here. It looks like some channels. Uh, you know, there's something interesting going on in here. So we'll see if we can figure out what that is. Okay, so the first thing that we do, um, that we can do with instantaneous attributes is we want to calculate the Hilbert transform. And so this is a mathematical operator that creates kind of like a companion shift by, by shifting everything 90 degrees in phase. And so you could think about it as adding a new dimension to the data. And it's very similar um, to the original data, but but there's a there's a subtle difference. So um, if we go down, um, the way to think about the Hilbert transform is that we're looking at the complex portion of the trace. And so this is why we call our instantaneous attributes the the complex part, the imaginary part. Um, and so this is this is a nice figure that I like to use. <laughs> I like to show where we have the actual seismic trace that we're able to observe and that we often observe, and that quadrature trace, the imaginary trace, that's what the Hilbert transform is trying to get at. Um, there's a lot of information. So a lot of this came from Tanner et al.'s 1979 uh, paper, which really established the foundational uh, mathematics for deriving these instantaneous attributes um, from the complex trace to the envelope, the phase and instantaneous frequency, all of those are extracted in a similar way. And so we're going to start with looking at some of those other attributes. All right, so back to the data. This is the instantaneous envelope, or you could think about it as the reflection strength. So it combines the original trace and the Hilbert transform trace to show us the total energy from both that real and imaginary part at each point. And so this could be really useful for identifying bright spots and also sequence boundaries. Next up, we have our instantaneous phase, which ranges from negative 180 to 180. So it's one of those cyclical attributes that we really want to be careful of if we're going to be putting our seismic attributes into machine learning. Um, what's great about instantaneous phase is it really highlights the continuity of events, um, regardless of what the amplitude is. So it's kind of taking out all that amplitude information uh, that can distract us. And so it brings out the really subtle stratigraphic features that can be harder to see, um, or maybe just don't catch your eye as much in the amplitude data. So we have these, these lovely uh, clinoforms, and you can imagine even if you wanted to pick horizons um, on uh, your seismic data, you can do that on the instantaneous phase. We also have the instantaneous frequency, which can be really good for helping us identify thin beds, attenuation, um, and even some hydrocarbon effects. And so in here, you can notice that the higher frequencies end up that redder color, and then the lower frequencies as a kind of green and blue color. So if we had hydrocarbons in this area, they might end up attenuating out some of the higher frequencies. And so those regions with hydrocarbons may look um, below them a little bit anomal anomalously low, lower in frequency. And so this is a nice, um, Summary of instantaneous envelope, instantaneous phase, and instantaneous frequency um, from Pradika in 2001, and kind of just very nicely summarized by Chopra and Marfer in their textbook in 2007. Um, just kind of reminding us that the instantaneous envelope is very sensitive to acoustic impedance. Um, it can help us understand better the lithology and the porosity, hydrocarbons, and even thin bed tuning. While the instantaneous phase is great for tracking those reflector continuity like I showed you and can help us detect unconformities and faults in those lateral changes in stratigraphy um, that might be a little bit more hidden or more subtle. And then instantaneous frequency is great for helping us identify abnormal attenuation, so maybe the presence of hydrocarbons, as well as the thin bed tuning. Okay, 
A uh, cosine of instantaneous phase is a seismic attribute that we use a lot in my research group because it normalizes the seismic trace while also preserving the polarity information. And so it's no longer, no longer cyclical. And that means we can use it as, um, as an input into <laughs> machine learning um, because we don't have that, that phase wrapping anymore. Um, and then this one, um, I want to show how we can use it for, for seismic stratigraphy. And so this is an example by uh, Dr. Tellez, um, where if we look at some of the seismic data, so this is some work he did on a prograding system, and you can see how he marked some onlap and toplap and some different features. And we have to spend a lot of time really looking at the seismic here, um, zooming in, trying to understand exactly which features are marked. But if we do the cosine of instantaneous phase, we can much, much, much more clearly do that seismic stratigraphy work because we can now see um, the onlapping, the downlapping, the toplapping, all those uh, sequence stratigraphic features um, that we're looking for a lot more easily in the cosine of instantaneous phase. Okay, so another track, um, <laughs> so getting back on track, uh, there's another set of instantaneous attributes called wavelet instantaneous attributes. And these were introduced back in 1989 by, Bo by Bodine. And they address more the instability of the conventional instantaneous attributes by focusing on um, the more kind of energetic parts of the signal. So those would be like the envelope peaks and troughs. So instead of calculating attributes at every sample point, these attributes are computed more at a, on an envelope level. Um, and then interpolated between the maxima and the minimum, which can also give us uh, geologically full, geologically meaningful uh, measurements. <laughs> and so this is the wavelet phase on the same data line that I've been showing you, which represents the phase values that were captured um, specifically at those envelope peaks and then interpolated to the local minima. And they provide a stable phase measurement that's less sensitive to noise and interference. So unlike the instantaneous phase, um, the wavelet phase can give us uh, a different representation of the actual seismic events. Um, same with uh, wavelet frequency. So that captures the frequency content at the points of maximum reflection strength also, and then extends these values to the envelope minima. And so it's more of a robust frequency estimate than the instantaneous frequency that I showed you before. You'll notice that we um, uh, you know, it kind of looks a little bit more smoothed in a sense. And so it reduces some of those fluctuations that we can see in the instantaneous frequency calculations. Um, and this is pretty important if you want to try not to overinterpret areas where you have the, the weaker signal. And so looking here at uh, wavelet frequency, I'm going to jump back to the instantaneous frequency next. And so you can kind of really see the difference. Um, I particularly see it down here in this deeper section around two seconds or so. I'm going to go back and forth one more time. And so here's the wavelet frequency. And then down here around two seconds, um, you can see in the instantaneous frequency how that noise is also getting picked up by the, this attribute. So in this case, if we were looking at something deeper, we may want to use that wavelet frequency instead. OK, so RMS amplitude is something probably a lot of you have heard of if you've dealt with seismic data before. Um, this seems to be one of the most popular uh, seismic attributes. It's a very, very common mathematical algorithm that helps us uh, understand and kind of map or quantitude the energy in the seismic reflection data. And so RMS amplitude um, is one of the earliest seismic attributes, kind of gaining prominence back in the 1970s. Um, it's very computationally efficient, and it has very robust results. So when we look at it, we use it a lot of times for reservoir characterization. Um, it could help us with some structural mapping. And so the equation of it is, is pretty straightforward, um, the way it's calculated. Uh, we take a window of samples. So again, you got to think about the parameters so you can window differently if you want to. Um, but so you take a window of samples and then you square the value in that window, find their average and take the square root. So root mean squared amplitude. Um, so it's so pretty straightforward. And so you can think about it as a way of measuring the average strength over the seismic signal. And because of the squaring, you kind of equalize out the, the peaks and the troughs. So you're getting a, a more general sense of that energy package. 
And so RMS amplitude is really great for a lot of reasons. Um, it's good when you're trying to map higher amplitude packages around noisy horizons because of that squaring and then taking the square root. Um, it helps cut through the noise to reveal uh, more of the true signal. It's also a really powerful tool for identifying amplitude um, anomalies that can indicate hydrocarbon presence, and it also serves as an excellent quality control check uh, during seismic processing. And we use it a lot in sequence stratigraphy also to help us understand variations, heterogeneities, and depositional patterns and environments. Okay, so here's an example of the uh, the RMS amplitude kind of co-rendered with, with seismic amplitude and more of a black and white. And so um, what you can see is that it does a really nice job of highlighting some of the potentially interesting amplitudes deeper, um, which weren't quite as apparent in the original seismic amplitude data itself. Um, and here's an example where we calculated RMS amplitude with a slightly smaller window. So remember I talked about windowing. And so you can notice now we've got uh, more brighter amplitudes, so those kind of brighter light greenish amplitudes because they're not being averaged out as much because of the smaller window. And so these are things you want to think about as you're going through calculating your attributes. All right, so amplitude volume transform is a really, really fun, I think visually fun, um, instantaneous attribute. Um, and I'm going to show you what it looks like. <laughs> so um, here's an example uh, from the Campos Basin. Um, and so you can see how AVT helps us identify um, kind of this very subtle fault uh, with more confidence. So I like it because it really, um, I feel like it gives us this outcrop look, like this three-dimensional aspect to it, um, which can help make these more subtle features really pop out. Okay, so um, so hopefully I've showed you why, why we may want to use it, um, because you can go back and forth and look at that fault between the orange arrows and notice how it's much more prominent. We would have the seismic interpreters a lot more confidence in terms of interpreting, you know, saying like, yes, there is a fault there. <laughs> so we'd more, have more confidence for our interpretation. Okay. <laughs> um, so this method was developed back in 99, uh, 1999, and it helps with not just like the faults I show, but can help identify channels, carbonate features, reflector unconformities, and even stratigraphic terminations. So I'm gonna go through really quickly how it is calculated. And there's a lot more information out there in the original papers, or I also have um, a lot more detail about it on the ASPE website that I run. And so the first thing that you do for amplitude volume transform is you calculate the analytic trace, which is combining the original seismic data with the Hilbert transform, so adding in that 90 degree phase shift. Um, and so this is, if, you know, if you're into the equations and stuff, um, which I try not to get too into too much in these mini lectures, um, what we've got here is uh, kind of like the capital U sub T equals the small case U sub T, and then the imaginary U sub T, where um, this is our original trace and then our imaginary Hilbert transform trace. After this, um, you so after combining the, the complex trace and analytic trace, um, the second step is calculating the root mean squared envelope within that sliding window. So again, going into this attribute, hopefully you're starting to see how uh, you have choices as an interpreter in terms of the parameterization and you want to make sure that, uh, that you're picking the right ones for what you're trying to see. And so doing the root mean squared helps us smooth out the data a little bit while still preserving the important features. All right, now, and then the third step, we take the inverse um, Hilbert transform of our RMS envelope, which ends up highlighting those vertical changes in the data. Pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> okay, so now I'm just going back to that original example and I'll flip through them. Uh, here is, again, the original seismic data, and then here is that um, ABT run. So hopefully that kind of encourages you to maybe try it out <laughs> in your own software package and on your own data. And so just to wrap up um, with a couple of thoughts about instantaneous attributes, I only covered a few of them. Um, there's a lot more that I like. Uh, recently, I've really been into Tiger kaiser energy. Um, so it's, it's amazing for helping kind of pull out uh, different geologic features. And I've got more examples of that up on my website and also on, uh, on elsewhere on the YouTube channel. And so to summarize, okay, I'm going to summarize, uh, complex trace, trace analysis 
um, are those that use the Hilbert transform, so the imaginary part of the, the complex trace, um, to extract instantaneous amplitude, phase, and frequency attributes. And so a lot of these are very useful. Um, I didn't really talk about like peak magnitude and peak frequency, but those are two of the attributes that we really like to use when we start um, putting attributes into machine learning. Um, the Tiger Kaiser Energy, like I just mentioned, it's really great for highlighting uh, discontinuities and measuring the localized energy variations. And the choice and combination of the attributes, um, the way you want to parameterize them, you always want to make sure that you're doing it, keeping in mind the quality of your data and also the purpose of your seismic interpretation. Um, so a lot of times as we start going through these attribute lectures, the first thing I do when I have a new data set um, that I'm trying to understand and run attributes on is I run them on the default parameters and then I analyze, okay, well, how might I be able to improve the parameters? Maybe I want to sample less of the region around it, or maybe I want to change the frequency um, spectrum that I'm calculating it in. So thinking about parameters and not just accepting the defaults in any software program is a great way to improve your interpretation. So thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.